Marriage on a global scale is facing a variety of challenges and changes. I'm not referring to the current obstacles and battles regarding who is and who is not allowed to marry, but rather the obstacles facing couples who do want to get into the married life. Over the past several decades, the nature of marriage has changed. Many people are choosing to live their lives with individuals not knowing and not understanding their mentality or merely focusing on their physical appearance without noticing the reality until after settling down. According to statistics collected in 2015, married couple have a 50% chance of staying together. That's equivalent to flipping a coin on your wedding day. Even for couples who do stay married, reports later on for being unsatisfied in their relationships. Such issues have led many to wonder, what has changed the nature of marriage that makes it less appealing for, for some, less satisfying for others, and generally less stable? This is why Sayyid Hussein Al-Qazwini has joined us tonight to discuss, to shed some light and answer these questions for us. Respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the second episode of Zahra the Great with me, your host, Ahmed Ali. Assalamu alaikum. Sayyidina, how are you? Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. In yesterday's episode, we began uh, the first episode uh, where we talked about Fatima, the daughter. Today, we're moving forward and we're talking about Fatima, the wife, to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Now, we touched about, uh, a little bit about uh, marriage yesterday and some issues, but before diving into issues, I would like to ask you to tell us about the historical events that happened uh, during the marriage of uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib with Fatima Zahra. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله. To you, my dear host, and to our dear viewers. The story of the marriage of Imam Ali to Fatima Zahra is a very beautiful story, and it's very, it's very interesting, and it says a lot about the personality of Imam Ali and a lot about the personality of Fatima Zahra. Yes. Uh, narration state that f first Abu Bakr came to propose to Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, but uh, Rasulullah refused, and he said it's not because of my, it's not a personal, you know, refusal, but the the marriage of Fatima Zahra is in the hands of Allah. She's a special case. It's not in my hands. It's in the hands of Allah. If Allah tells me to marry her, I'll marry her. But if, if he doesn't, I have no permission. Abu Bakr left. She received another proposal from, from Umar ibn Khattab. Umar came to propose. Wow. Yes. Again, Rasulullah said the following. Amruha fi sama. Amruha biyad sama. Her, you know, the consent is in the heavens, yeah. meaning in the hands of Allah. I can't say yes for my own. Historians say that Abu Bakr and Umar, they came to Imam Ali alayhi salam. He was in the fields, he was working. Imam Ali was a, a worker, he, was, yeah. he would work in the fields. Wow. He wasn't sitting at home relaxing, he was working in the, in the fields with his bare hands. He was a gardener, he would plant trees, he would dig wells. Mm -hmm. They say that Amir al-Mu'mineen planted a thousand trees on his own Allah. and dug, I don't know how many wells, wells of water for people in Medina. They came to him, they told him, Ya Ali. Abu Bakr said, I proposed, I was rejected. Umar said, I proposed, I was rejected. You go and propose. You are the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You're the closest person to Rasulullah. You won't be rejected. And you're single. Why would they do that? Good question. Good question. Um, yeah, you know, um, 
we don't know what the what the motive is. But let's give them here here in this case. Mm-hmm. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they saw Amir al Mu'minin as single, being the, the the best fit. He's being the best fit, and they told him come and propose to uh, the daughter of Rasulullah. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that everything that these two men had was of evil intention. Yeah. Not everything. Yes, the matter of Khilafah taking the way the Khilafa away. This was definitely inshallah planned. We'll touch and, upon that. Yeah, yeah, we'll touch upon that inshallah towards the and end of our series. So they came and they told Imam Ali, "You go and yeah. propose." Imam Ali said, "Fine." He came, and he knocked at the door of Rasulullah, and he sat and he remained quiet. He remained quiet. He's, he's, he's there to propose. Rasulullah waited for Imam Ali to speak. Imam Ali put his head down, shy, embarrassed, not a word to say. You know, nowadays, <laughs> nowadays when, you know, here in Iraq it's a norm that when uh, family members or friends, they have a proposal happening, a they team. want you to be there. Or the, the one proposing, he wants you to be there with him. So sometimes we attend. And the young men have no shame, there's no embarrassment. They go chewing gum with the hairstyles. Wow. I see some young men, if you see them from far, you think they're wearing turbans. Then when you come close, you see that, no, it's their hair, it's not huh. their, their turbans. They go proposing like this, the way they're dressed, the way they talk. The, they're, they go proposing, texting on their phone, taking selfies. This is young men today. And this is Imam Ali proposing. Imam Ali was shy, embarrassed. He was embarrassed to speak in the presence of Rasulullah. He had his head down. Rasulullah started. Told him, Ya Ali, la'allaka jitta khatiban. Allah. Perhaps you've, you've come to propose to my daughter. Qala bala, Ya Rasulullah. Yes, indeed. He said, that's fabulous news. He said, but let me go and ask Fatimah al-Zahra. He went and he asked Fatimah al-Zahra. Fatimah al-Zahra. Imagine if Imam Ali, who's a man, was embarrassed. Imagine Fatimah Allah. She didn't speak a word. They asked her that Ali ibn Abi Talib is here to propose to you. She didn't say a word. Rasulullah said his famous quote, Subhanallah, mm-hmm. Sukutuha Radaha. That her silence is proof of her acceptance. And scholars today, they say this became a general principle. Yes. When a virgin female, if she's asked, if she's proposed to, and she doesn't say anything, that means she accepts. Because if she doesn't want, she would object. But when she wants, or when she, accept, she, uh, she accepts, she's embarrassed to say to her father, yes, I want to marry this person. Mm-hmm. She remains quiet. So her quietness is proof of her acceptance. Rasulullah told Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, I don't mind, and she doesn't mind. But we have to wait and see what Allah Azza wa Jal says. Jibra'il came down, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Anna Allah yaqra'uka salam wa yaqul, Zawwuju al-Nura min al-Nur, Zawwuju Ali min Fatima. Let the light marry the light. Let Ali marry Fatima al-Zahra. And in other narrations, that, that the khutbah, the aqd, Khutbat al-Aqd, the marriage ceremony between Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima al Zahra was conducted in the sky. Allah conducted the Aqd. Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima al Zahra did not need to perform a marriage contract because it was because it was performed in the sky, in the heavens. خلاص, they got married. Rasulullah asked Imam Ali alayhi salam. He told him, Ya Ali, what do you own? They wanted to build a house, provide a house for the newly wedded couple. I told him, Ya Ali, what do you own? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I own two things. Only two things, my shield and my sword. That's the only thing that I own. I told him, as for your sword, there's no way we could sell your sword. If we sell your sword, that means we've sold Islam. Because if it wasn't for your sword, Islam wouldn't have survived. ما قام الإسلام إلا بسيف علي 
Islam spread because of the sword of Ali ibn Talib. But for your shield, you don't need a shield, Ya Ali ibn Talib. When did you ever use your shield? We could do without your shield. They went and they sold the shield. Rasulullah gave the duty and responsibility of furnishing and preparing the house of Amir al Mu'minin and Ali ibn Talib. When I say the house, I mean a room besides the masjid. Oh. It was a simple room. Not a mansion. Not, not, a ma not even an independent house. It yeah. was basically a room. Because the masjid of Rasulullah, let's say it was a square or a rectangle, and there were rooms all around it. And these rooms, and the Quran speaks of these rooms. Yes. Al-Hujurat. Yes. Al-Hujurat means the chambers of the rooms. And all of these rooms, they had doors to the masjid. They had doors that would open to the masjid. One of those rooms was for Ali and Fatima. The others were for the wives of Rasulullah. One of them was for Al-Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah. And then, in the few, eventually, Allah ordered the Prophet to close all the doors of the room surrounding the masjid except, except the door of Ali and Fatima and Zahra. Why? Why did he order him to close those rooms? Because it is forbidden to enter the masjid, any masjid, not just the masjid of Rasulullah, in the state of Janaba. In the state of Janaba. So he asked them to close their doors, except Ali and Fatima al Zahra. They were allowed to come to the masjid even if they were in the state of Janaba. So we're talking about a room, room next to the masjid. Door to door to the masjid. Rasulullah gave the duty of preparing the house and furnishing the house to his uncle uh, Al Abbas and to Abu Bakr to furnish the house. But what kind of furniture? Simple furniture. It was sand, there was no carpet. The most basic of furniture was the house of. Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al This was all in preparation for the wedding. Now as for the night of the wedding, do we have time to discuss this? Um, we can, but briefly. Briefly. Very brief. The night of the wedding of Amir al-Mu'mineen, of course the wedding was something very simple. It was a, uh, it was a feast. Food was given. And, and uh, Islamically, it's recommended to provide food on the day of the wedding. No music, no dancing, just give food, announce your marriage, and ask people to, to come and eat. The night of the wedding, Fatima Tizara had prepared a dress. Had prepared a dress. The night of her wedding, she heard knocking on the door. She went and opened the door. It was a, an old lady, a, a beggar, poor. She was poor. She wanted money. Fatima Tizahra didn't own anything except her wedding dress. She went and she gave her wedding dress to the lady. News reached Rasulullah. Rasulullah asked her, Ya Fatima, why? Why did you give your dress? It's the night of your it's wedding. It's a wedding dress. It's a wedding dress. She said, Ya Rasulullah, the Quran says, Lan tanalu birra hatta tunfiqu tuhubun. You will not reach the stage of uh, virtuousness. Right? Unless you give that which you love. When I give that which I love, I give my wedding dress. Simple wedding, simple dress, simple house. It was all simple, but look at the outcome. Today, young men and women, they think that happiness comes from a very big wedding. The biggest wedding, the, the most expensive dress, the most expensive house, the most expensive furniture. Even the cards, the invitation cards are so expensive. They think that it's these kind of things that bring them happiness. I have a lecture that I gave a couple of years ago called Un-Islamic Wedding Habits. Un-Islamic? Un-Islamic Wedding Habits. Because a lot of times, unfortunately, weddings which are meant to be happy, which are meant... A wedding signifies the beginning of your marriage. Mm -hmm. It's an important day. A lot of people commit all sorts of sins on that, on that day, wedding yeah. day. Lack of hijab, music, dancing, 
there's alcohol, mixing, the unbelievable, unbelievable amount of spending. They could spend that money on more useful things. It's crazy what people do on, on their weddings. And I wish that that wedding, that that marriage lasts. Half of it ends up, half of them end up breaking up. Imagine all that amount that well, is being spent on weddings, mm -hmm. it's going into the trash. People have that, that, uh, that motto, if you will, of, of YOLO. You only live once. Yeah. So w yeah. wouldn't that be you know, a good way to, to, to live life once? <laughs> Spending in, uh, on, uh, on your wedding night? You only live once, but at least do things in your life that are worth it. Yes. A wedding, I'm not saying, you know, ha uh, have your wedding out on the street mm -hmm. or in the back of your garage, in your garage. No, have your wedding in a nice place, but don't disobey Allah on the day of your yes. wedding. People disobey because Allah. You're beginning a new life. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm hearing stories even here in Karbala, here in the city of Karbala. Yeah. Now, weddings have music and dancing. Some of them are mixed. All sort of things. All sorts, all sorts of, here in Karbala. If, if we're having things here in Karbala, what should we expect, you know, uh, mm. of what people will do in America and, and Europe mm. and in Canada and mm -hmm. other places, and unfortunately. Speaking of, you know, uh, globally, what people understand of, of marriage, uh, there's an article written by Eli Finkel and colleagues published in 2014 uh, states that many of the changes that have taken place with regards to our expectations for marriage may actually set the stage for many marriages to fail and for many remaining marriages to feel unsatisfying. And that's exactly what's going on today. They have so they have that high expectation. I mean, for a man, he wants a woman to be like such a model. He wants a woman to be, you know, out of 10. Some actually show their, their friends, how much out of 10 is she? Yeah. And she he, you know, materialistic things. And, and some, it's, it's not bad. I mean, looking for, for a beautiful wife, that's not something bad. But on the other hand, vice versa, we have the ladies, you know, the sisters. I want a guy who has this kind of job, who has this kind of house, this kind of car. And we have these obstacles, these high expectations that even if maybe a guy may ever overlook or a girl overlooks that, she will feel unsatisfied because her expectations were not met. Linking this to Fatim to Zahra السلام, and her marriage, what kind of wife did she, was she? Did she have any expectations? Although we mentioned simplicity, Right. Fatima Tizara alayhi salam, she married Imam Ali knowing that he didn't own anything. He didn't own any, uh, anything materialistically. He was poor. He was poor. First of all, he was an orphan. His father had died mm. at a young age while he was young. Two, he didn't own anything. He owned his sword and he owned his shield. He wasn't a landowner. He wasn't a landlord. So Fatima Tizahra knew that she was marrying a man. Materialistically, he didn't own anything. But spiritually. But spiritually. Commander of the faithful. Spiritually, she knew that Amir al-Mu'mineen was the second after her father. Second man after her father. No one reached to his position. Not in his knowledge. Not in his bravery and courage and wisdom and uh, piety and humility, no one compared to Imam Ali. So, this, this shows you what a person Fatima Zahra was. Yes. She knew what person to, to marry. Abu Bakr was rich. If Fatima Zahra wanted to marry someone who was rich, Abu Bakr was rich, everyone knew that. Everyone knows mm -hmm. that Abu Bakr had money. She didn't go after money. But some say that it's, it's Ahl al-Bayt. Like they, they are brought here to live a simple life because they are devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, does, would that apply to everyone else? It's not about a simple life. It's about knowing what will make you happy. Fatima Zahra was smart. She knew what would make her happy. She knew that let, let her marry someone who's rich. Does that necessarily will bring her happiness? She knew that her happiness is with Imam Ali. 
the children that she will have, that we'll talk about tomorrow, mm -hmm. as Fatima, Fatima the mother. The mother. T tonight we're talking about Fatima Zahra, the wife. The children that she will have, they will come from this man, said children. This was all pre-planned. Fatima Zahra was planning this. Yes. So she knew what she was signing up for. She was signing up for a simple marriage, simple wedding, simple life, very. But in return, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander of the faithful, the most pious, the most knowledgeable. So Fatima Zahra, yes, she's, she's infallible, she comes from the Ahl al-Bayt, but at the same time, she's a normal human being as well. We should not make her superhuman and say, well, you know, let's not compare ourselves to her. No. But that's reality, though. No. The Quran says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا As a role model. Rasulullah is a role model. He's a human being. If Rasulullah was so above us, he was above human, then he would not be a, a role model. A role model is someone that you know you could compare to. You have something in comparison relate to. to. You, have, you could relate to, to that person. The Halbits were human beings, but they were great human beings. They were perfect human beings. Gifted. They were gifted. However, it doesn't mean that they didn't have a will. I mean, some people, they have an image of Ahl Bayt that they had to be good whether they liked it or they, or they didn't. No, it wasn't like that. The Ahl Bayt, they chose to be good. They could have been bad just like everyone else. Just like anyone else wants to be bad. They had the choice. We, we, we shouldn't have this perspective of Ahl al-Bayt that they were forced to be good. No, mm. they were not forced to be good. They chose to be good. And that is why they became their good role models. Mm -hmm. That is why we emphasize on them. Because mm -hmm. they chose to be good, not that they had to be good. Yes. Inshallah, we'll continue this, but after a short break. Inshallah. Respected viewers, do stay tuned for Inshallah, come back to you shortly, but after this short break. <laughs> Respected viewers, brothers and sisters, once again, Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the second part of today's episode. Before the break, we touched upon Fatima, the wife. This was discussed with my dear guest, Sayyid Hussain Al Qazwini. Welcome back, Sayyidna. Thank you very Allah much. Allah Now, before the break, just a quick recap. We uh, talked about the historical events regarding the marriage of Fatima Zahra, alayhi salam, and we also talked about, you know, compared it, uh, the simplicity uh, that she chose. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, she chose to live by uh, as a wife to Imam Ali al Talib. Although she had, or Imam Ali had nothing uh, to own, yet she accepted it. You know, neglecting or you know leaving uh, riches and so on and so forth. Now, if you want to compare that simplicity to today, how would you compare? Today, I think we have a problem. We have, a, we have a major problem, mm -hmm. lack of simplicity. Today there's no simplicity. Rarely, one out of every 100 youth, you might find... Uh, that's 1%. That's 1%, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very rare. Maybe it's an exaggeration, I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe others will disagree. But from my experience, from my travels, from my visiting of various communities, I see that simplicity is, is very rare. You rarely find a young lady that is willing to marry a young man that uh, that has nothing, that owns nothing. Well, in our world right now, you can't own nothing and raise a family. Like for example, the, the simple needs have, have you know, the, the prices of simple needs have, have arised. Of course. You know what I mean? So for a house, if you want rent in the West or here, minimum five hundred dollars. 
and it goes up to two thousand dollars. Right. If someone who doesn't own anything, for a simple job man, it's hard to get married, don't you think? It's it's hard to get married. However, we have to think of we have there's two points. Number one, you know, first of all, the Quran. The Quran says, "In ya wa ankhu al ayama minkum wa salihina min ibadikum wa imaikum." If they are poor, Allah will make them rich. Not make make them rich, Yughnihum Allah doesn't mean it will make them rich, rich. Mm-hmm. No, it means it makes them, you know, sufficient. They'll have sufficiency. What they, yeah, sufficiency. They'll have what they want. Two, today there's no one that will, you know, sleep on the street. In America, in Europe, there's a lot that sleep on the street. Oh, yeah. Not from our communities. First of all, Huh, from our communities, yes, of course. We of can, course, we can there's say. a lot of homeless people. Yes, but, but not from our communities. Why? Number one, uh, those who live in the West, you know, they live in countries where there's financial support. Yes, government support. Whether you're in Europe, in the UK, in Sweden, in Germany, and in Denmark or the US or Canada, there's financial support. How about no in countries like No one can like say that. You know, how will I live? Government support. Mm-hmm. This is one. Two. Even if you don't own a dime, every young man who is capable, unless he's paralyzed and cannot work, every young man who is, who is physically capable, who has a good you know, functioning mind, even if he doesn't own anything in his pockets, but he has the potential to create millions, to generate millions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every person a, a functioning body and a functioning brain. Go and work. Yes. Go on, and Allah has given us time. Time is money. Go and work. Have faith in Allah Azza wa Jal. Marry this young man. As long as this young man is uh, is physically able, he will go and work and he will make money. Yes. Today, no. If he doesn't have a a house, if he doesn't own a house, if he doesn't own a job, if he doesn't have a job, if he doesn't make good amount of money, I'm not going to give my daughter to him. And unfortunately, what is happening nowadays is that the young man, he might not have the right credentials. When I say credentials, the religious credentials. You see, a lot of young men, he doesn't come from a, you know, a religious family. He doesn't have a religious background. Uh, you know, he's not known for his akhlaq and religion. But as long as he's rich, people will give their daughter. Because he's rich. He has money. He has a car. He owns a shop. Even here, here in the Middle East, I'm not just speaking in the West. While a good person from a good family, religious family, great akhlaq, but he doesn't own, he's not giving. Either the young girl is not interested, or the family is not interested. This is a major problem. Yes. One of the, ma- one of the reasons why divorces are, are so widespread and mm-hmm. popular today widespread is because people are giving their daughters to the wrong people mm-hmm. to the wrong young men and the young men are proposing to the wrong young girls sometimes the parents don't have a choice especially in the west why don't they have a choice and for example i mean they in the west every child has or every adult has his rights. I mean, if, if a person wants to marry a certain girl, even it's happening right now in, in, in the Middle East. They marry who they want. They marry Play who it. they want. Then we address our topic to, to, the, to the young men and young women that are getting married. That who, who are you getting married to? Yes. Who are you choosing? What are your priorities? Uh, is it just looks? You know, looks used to be a criteria only for young men. They would base solely, solely their criteria on looks. Today, it's becoming the other way around yeah. as well. Young women, their, their major decision is based on looks. If he's good looking, I accept. If he's not good looking, khalas. The other, the other qualities, you know, they're, they're nice to have, but they're not so important. He's religious, that's good. That's an education, that's good. But is he good looking? This is a problem. That we're basing our decisions, young men and women, they're basing their decisions on artificial issue, on, on looks. On looks, only on looks. He has nice eyes. He has, he's wearing a turban hair. He has turban hair. That's a new style. That's a new style. The clothing, 
the beard, the the, the skinny clothing. It's unbelievable. It's, it is. What, what youth are, are dressing like. I'm not talking about the young women, the young men, the, all the new styles that are coming out. And this is what's attractive today. This young man who dresses like a rock star has more chance of winning a young lady than a religious person who's dressed modestly. His hair, is, his hair and his beard is nice. He dresses nicely, he has good akhlaq. This person doesn't have that much of a, that many options. He doesn't have much luck in marriage. Mm -hmm. This is a problem today. It is. This is a major problem. Now, what kind of qualities, now these are the, the, the negative aspects. What kind of qualities should a man look for in a wife or future wife? Or vice versa? I, well, to young men, for both, I, I think the following will, will help both. I, I, I tell young men that your, the first quality that you should be looking for, or you should ask. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you see a, you see a young lady, will she make a good mother? Mm -hmm. I'm going to have children from this young You're lady. You're going to raise a generation. I'm, she's not just going to be spending time with me. Yes. She's going to be spending time with my children. Can I trust her with my children? My children are going to learn from her. They're going to learn from him. Is that okay? If the answer is yes, and you're satisfied with that, go ahead. But if the answer is no, then that, that's a problem. This young lady, she, she might be good looking. And you know that. You know, you're, you're entertained by her looks. You're, so, you're, you're happy with her looks. But will she make a good mother for your children? You know the answer is no. So why? Why waste your time? Why waste her time? Why, you know, risk your emotions and spend so much money and time and energy and you risk, by, by getting married and knowing that you might get a divorce, you're risking not getting married again. Why? Why do that? From day one, ask that is this young, will this young lady be a good mother for my children? Some people have the idea that I will teach her. You know, if, if she has a certain mentality or they're not planning to have any kids until like for 10 or 15 years. And in that time, the man in his head, he's saying, well, I can teach her the proper ways. I don't think that's realistic. Uh, a lot of people have that mentality. Right, right. I will teach her. No, what, what happens is she ends up teaching him. <laughs> she ends up teaching him. You know, habits are contagious. Good habits are contagious. Bad habits are contagious. Yes. The same way you learn good habits, you learn bad habits. If you marry someone who's not religious, thinking that you could persuade them, they might end up persuading you. She listens to music. You think you can change that. But what happens is, she gets you to listen to music. She doesn't pray, and you pray, you think you could change that. What happens is she gets you to stop praying. Stop praying. Is this possible or is this not possible? It's very much possible. Some may disagree, but... Because a man has more influence on, on a woman. That's what some people say. Mm. But yet women have, as we, yesterday we spoke... I disagree. Uh, either men and women have the same amount of influence on, on each other, or sometimes the woman has more influence yes. on the man. So to say that I will marry this young lady and I will... No, I'll give you an example. Hijab. She doesn't wear hijab. Once we get married, I'll convince Great her example. to wear hijab. Who says? Who says once you get married, you'll be able to convince her? Maybe she'll be able to convince you to keep her hijab oh, off. off. Not just her, but her daughters as well. So it's a, it's a risk. It's definitely a risk. It could happen, it could not happen. It's 50-50. Why mm -hmm. do you want to gamble with your, life part, with your life partner? Instead, choose someone that you will be proud of. She will, make, she will be a good mother to your children. Mm -hmm. if, if we could you know, learn anything, it's this. I know it's not easy. I know this is not, maybe some viewers are listening to me now and you know, they're saying, what is the say talking about? He, he, he thinks that it's very easy to choose a, a yeah. mother like Fatima Tizara. I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy. But, but I want the brothers not to be negligent. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you do your best. You go and you choose someone. You think that she's good, she's religious, with good akhlaq. 
She happens to be someone bad. You tried. At the end of the day, you tried. You did your best. There are some that are negligent, meaning they're careless. They didn't do their homework. They didn't ask enough about this person. They didn't get to know this person. The looks bought them. They saw the looks. Khalas. They didn't care about anything else. These people are negligent. And they will pay the price. They will either have to go through divorce or will have to deal with a very bad spouse, an immoral spouse. Or they will have to pay the price to their children. They will have difficulty with their children. You know, it will be a harder work on them to raise their children properly in an Islamic way. Or, you know, the possibilities are a lot. The le you know, one of them is divorce. Yes. Divorce is one of the possibilities. The other possibility is that you'll have a ruined marriage. A miserable life. A miserable life. Or your children will be not really... It's... Really, spouse selection is something very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy job. Now, we've talked about uh, the qualifications or the, uh, the qualities that a man or a woman should look for in the future uh, spouse, husband, uh, or wife. But as I was researching uh, for this topic, uh, I found something that really shocked me. Uh, they did a study in 2015, and uh, the specialists in the field of divorce and marriage stated many relationships are ruined because of the restrictions placed on the wife by the husband. And unfortunately, many of the situations that came up were Muslim Islamic situations where men and it's it's known worldwide and that's unfortunate where Muslim men are viewed to imprison their wife at home she cannot leave she cannot work she cannot do anything she cannot interact with the community now my question is is that did Imam Ali Ibn Talib I know that the, the Ahlul Bayt are our role models and whatever they do, we follow in their footsteps. Did Imam Ali ibn Talib restrict Fatim to Zahra from you know, going out of the house, staying inside, and you know, keeping her away from the community and community affairs? Uh, first of all, regarding the study that you mentioned, I would disagree. Uh, from the Muslims that I've come across in the West, I've rarely found... you know. Um, this is conducted by... You know, by people from the West who sure, view Muslims. Sure, sure, that's fine. But from my experience, mm -hmm. I haven't come across men that you know are dictators and do not allow their wives to leave the house or they can't work. No, on the contrary, most well, Muslims leave the are, West, East. East, yeah, we might have a problem. And this may lead to divorce. Right, right, true. Uh, in the East, it, it is a problem. Here, maybe in Iraq, especially in you know areas where. There's a lack of education, lack of, lack of education. It's a male-dominated society. Places like the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia, uh, some parts of Iraq maybe, where there's, you know, where there's ignorance, you, you might have cases like that. But it doesn't mean that Islam promotes such behavior. Mm -hmm. um, in the life of Imam Ali and Fatima al-Zahra, no. No, uh, Imam Ali did, never had to restrict Fatima al-Zahra on anything. We never saw... History doesn't tell us that, you know, Fatima al-Zahra wanted to go somewhere while Imam Ali did not allow her. No, on the contrary, they lived peacefully. They divided the responsibilities. Narrations tell us that Amir al-Mu'mineen told Fatima al-Zahra that, that I will take care of the chores outside of the house. You will take care of the chores inside the house. Mm -hmm. And even inside the house, you would help her. Imam Ali would help Fatima al Zahra cook and clean and take care of their children. They, they, they lived a very peaceful life, be very beautiful life, to the point that Imam Ali was narrated saying that if, uh, you know, if I were to have a rough day, a difficult day, as soon as I'd come back home and look at the face of Fatima al Zahra, all of my agonies would go away. I would be no. at peace. I would be comfortable, you know. In some families now, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. There are some men that say, you know, I'm happy as soon as I come home and I see my wife, I remember all of my tragedies and my problems. Wow. Fatima al made her husband forget everything. This is how a wife should be. And this is how a husband should be as well. Not just the wife. 
husband and wife should be a source of comfort. Yes. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا He made between you love and mercy. A husband should be a source of comfort for his wife. A wife harmony. should be a source of comfort for her husband. Yes. And this is how they were. That is why Amir al-Mu'mineen at the loss of Fatima al-Zahra, it was a major loss for him. Yes. For many years he would still remember Fatima al-Zahra. For many years after. Uh, in Nahj al-Balagha, towards the end of Nahj al-Balagha, Amir al-Mu'mineen was asked, why don't you dye your beard? You know, your, your beard has become full of gray hair. Why don't you dye your beard? He said, no, because uh, I'm still in mourning. I'm still in mourning. You know, I'm sure you've seen in the Arabic culture, when you, when you mourn someone, you don't dye your beard. Yes. If those who dye their beard, usually, but at times of mourning, they don't dye their beard. He, say, he says, um, we're, still in, we're still mourning. Here, historians say, who, who is he mourning? Some say he's mourning Rasulullah. He's still mourning Rasulullah after 30 years. Others say he's still mourning Fatima al-Zahra. Imagine the impact that Fatima al-Zahra had on the life of Imam Ali that after 30 years he was still mourning her. Allah. This was a, a wife, a genuine, loving, caring, obedient, compassionate wife mm -hmm. like Fatima al-Zahra. As a conclusion, if you can just set for us a few guidelines of how to be satisfied as a couple. A few. I say that satisfy your spouse and you'll be satisfied. The thing is, sometimes you satisfy the other part. Won't be, you know, won't, won't, won't meet the requirements. Yes, but generally speaking, generally speaking, when a husband is a good husband to his wife, she'll be a good, she'll be a good wife to him. Be a good wife to your husband, he'll be a good husband to you. Usually, so it's usually both ways. this is like... It's both ways, absolutely. If you don't want to, if you want to, you know, it's your way or the highway, you want to run the house, you want to eat the, f you know, you want to provide the food at home, the food that you want to eat, and you want to control the house, the other spouse will not take it. Mm -hmm. You want to be a dictator, that person will be a dictator as well. Be a good husband, you'll have a good wife. Be a good wife you'll have a good husband. I think it works that way. Mm -hmm. I, really, I really think it works that way. Telling your husband that be good, do this, do that, it won't work. Show him. Show him what a good wife you are and what you're deserving of and he'll be that husband for you. Show your wife that you're a good husband and that you've provided her everything that she deserves and she'll provide you everything that you deserve. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, you know, good deeds are, are contagious. It's yes. like a smile. Smile to anyone, usually they'll smile back. Usually, 90% of the cases, they'll smile back. Whether it's kids, the eld elderly, random strangers on the street. Pass by someone and smile, you'll get a smile back. What, what, what forced that person to smile? It's contagious. Good yes. deeds are contagious. Be a good husband and you'll get a good wife. Uh, I think that's the key, that's the key to success mm -hmm. in, in marriage. That do your job, do your job, and wait, wait to see what will happen from the other. Yes, there are some, you know, that will take you for take you for granted. Yes, there are some wives that will serve their husbands for so many years, but the husband will remain negligent, and vice versa. There are rare cases, but in general, uh, you know, scholars say jubilatun nufus ala hubbi man ahsana ilayha. We human beings, we love those who do good to us. Yes. Strangers, let alone people that we, we know love. and love and live with. Mm -hmm. Let's try it at least. Let's try. Let's it. try it and let's see what happens. Hopefully, thank you very much for joining us tonight. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give us uh, satisfying lives. Uh, Insha'Allah. Uh, respected viewers, uh, today's topic was revolved or revolved uh, around Fatima al Zahra as the wife to Imam Ali al Talib. How she set the examples for females and how Imam Ali bin Talib set the role uh, for males. Thank you very much for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.